It's time for the Sonic Truth Dynasty Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm Alan Seslowski of rotowire.com, along with Theo Greminger and Cody Carpentier sitting in for the Podfather guys. A lot to cover, including our rookie flag plant. So stay tuned for the show, and we will hit that up towards the end. Too much free agency going on as it relates to Dynasty guys. Not to get into it right away. Let's waste no time, Theo Greminger. So Russell Wilson, I think that's the biggest piece that's going to have a lot of fallout. Russ Wilson goes to Pittsburgh, signs that vet minimum deal. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar, but for those who are not, very quickly, Russell Wilson was like more likely than not to sign for the vet minimum because he was going to get his 38 mil no matter what. So the Broncos were going to have to pick up whatever piece that the signing team did not. Theo, start talking about how... Uh, first of all, is this a camp battle we're going to see here between Kenny Pickett and Russell Wilson, or is this here, take the job, and that's why he signed for the vet minimum? Well, they're saying the right things. Mike Tomlin's saying, you know, we're, this is going to be a competition, but Mike Tomlin met with Russell Wilson twice this week. I'm sure they had deep, uh, you know, conversations about what's going on with the team, and I think it's a, it's clear as day that Russell Wilson's going to have the job opening week. I think for, for us in fantasy, I don't think this really – moves the needle too much in terms of us wanting to target Russell Wilson, but it does make me intrigued with George Pickens this year. I love the fit. We saw the high touchdown total for Cortland Sutton last year. We know Russell Wilson will take shots downfield. How many shots downfield? I'm not sure. I think it's going to be a run heavy team, but I do like this one for George Pickens. And I do think this is, is clearly Russell Wilson as a starter. Cody, there's going to be a, a quarterback competition, but it might be between Kenny Pickett and Mason Rudolph. Maybe, uh, or maybe Mason Rudolph becomes a, a a tangible asset to trade, and they can get a draft pick for him. Um, but I do think that there is a competition here. I do think it is between now and probably the second week of training camp going to be a competition. Everything Mike Tomlin does up in Latrobe for those training camps in the fall is a competition. I was up there last year, thankfully, and was able to see some of those things. And it, there's not a single player on that roster that doesn't, you know, maybe TJ Watt, maybe TJ Watt is gifted that spot, but, and Cam Hayward, but everybody, everybody up there is working for that job. And, to be quite honest with you, you guys have seen the fall off of Russell Wilson, just as I have, just as everybody has, these guys are not, you know, you know, miles apart as far as what they're currently bringing to the table. Um, we'd like to believe Russell Wilson's going to be, you know, go back in time a couple of years and, and bring some of that magic to Pittsburgh and play with Arthur Smith and have a running game. And he's got some nice weapons, but we even saw Deontay Johnson potentially the trade block. So I, I do think there's some work in through to be had. He's got to obviously pick up this offense, get connections with these receivers and see how that stuff, that transition goes. Um, but I, I, by no, by no means do I think this is just a, you know, hand him the job. And that's just a benefit that Pittsburgh has. Like you just mentioned with the uh, veteran minimum where Denver's playing paying them all that money. They don't have to just pay play run because they're paying him 40 million they're not paying him anything so um it, it's kind of just a you know i don't want to say it's a it's a free role for for pittsburgh but it's it's a great opportunity for both sides i believe that uh russell wilson was probably promised some playing time uh again it, like you said camp competition uh can change everything because russell wilson theo did have a couple other options he was considering las vegas raiders he was considering the patriots do you think that russ chose wisely I think in terms of, of the team that's uh, most ready to go next year, it's definitely the Pittsburgh Steelers. There's a lot of talent on that roster. And I think Russell Wilson, in terms of getting things right and sort of ending his career on like sort of a high note, being attached to Mike Tomlin, a proven winner, uh, and somebody respected across the NFL, I think was a, was a better idea for him than going to a New England offense that could be an absolute train wreck. Yeah. Uh, well. Yeah, I got I got one note here for this before we leave it at this. This is just one more reason to remember why we bring up hand size in quarterbacks when you go through the NFL combine. Kenny Pickett, first percentile, Russell Wilson, 90th percentile. So hands always win. So yeah, Russ probably gonna be the starter. And just you know as what a they say, Alan, in basketball, hand down, man down. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. The uh and just to remind you, uh Cody's famous question to uh to Kenny Pickett, that was the one that got on ESPN, right? The hand size question. <laughs> Yeah, and he said nobody's worried about it. Nobody, nobody, nobody in the NFL has asked me a single question about my hand size. You know, they're going to draft me top five overall. And uh, in all no fairness, worries. though, Cody, was hand size the reason that Kenny Pickett has, let's call it, say, has not 
lived up to first round quarterback expectations or has there been other things since you've observed him? There's been other things, but I mean, hand size and, and, and ball control completion percentage, those things kind of work together and 13 touchdowns, 13 picks in 25 games, 62% completion percentage, not exactly something to write home about. And that's, you know, that, that can be tied to hand size, just being able to control that football a little bit better. Yeah, I always make the comparison. It's like, you know, in, in my believe it or not, guys, there was a time where I was able to almost dunk a basketball. Now I could barely touch the net. And I had a lot more luck when I was able to hold a tennis ball and dunk it than an actual basketball. So that, uh, again, hand size proportional to the ball does make a difference. Last thing I want to ask you, Cody, before I um, move over to our, our um, next topic is Deontay Johnson. Is he better off for fantasy football? Because there's a lot of teams that, that drafted Deontay aggressively last year thinking bounce back with positive regression to the touchdowns a uh, little bit of a disappointing season, but Deontay Johnson, is he better off staying in Pittsburgh with Russell Wilson? Or do you think that he could benefit from, you know, new environment and an unknown quarterback at this point? I think he could benefit. I, I, you look at what this offense has for talent around it, and it's easy to tie Pickens to Metcalf and lock it to, or, and, and Deontay Johnson to lock it. But as far as the, Pittsburgh Steelers go, and I think building this franchise going forward, um, he's entering a contract year. They're going to have to pay him, and I think if they can get rid of him, he's 27 and a half years old, going to be 28 a year from now when he's due a contract. I would try to get rid of him, and, and this is a historical draft class as far as top end and as far as depth, and I've said it multiple times on multiple shows, I think Ricky Pearsall in the slot in this offense would be chef's kiss and he, he'd come in and, and immediately open up this offense for 700 yards and could replace Deontay Johnson with something that's more dependable from an injury basis. Theo, the last thing I want to ask you about the Pittsburgh wide receivers is they also released Allen Robinson this week. No surprise there. Didn't work out. Calvin Austin, a couple years ago, fourth rounder, any life here for dynasty fantasy football. I mean, he could be on the, you know, he could be like hanging on to a roster spot in, in 22 leagues or in 30 leagues. He's, you know, basically he's on the cut block. So Calvin Austin dynasty outlook. Calvin Austin stylistically with that speed is definitely going to help him. But I, I think if we see Deontay Johnson move on, I love what Cody said about Ricky Persall, uh, especially in that second round. I think the Alan, the, the George Pickens gets the bump up. I think that, the running back usage for Harris and Warren is going to be strong next year with Arthur Smith. Pat Fryermuth could see a little bit of bump, but I think Cody's spot on that that second round pick, that's been a spot that under Mike Tomlin, Pittsburgh's had great success with Juju Smith-Schuster, George Pickens, Pat Fryermuth, all second round picks. Keep they've it going. Draft, Mike Wallace. Also, Mike Wallace. They've also drafted some fourth rounders that have hit, but that second round, like I don't think they're going to use their first round pick on a wide receiver. But Cody brings up Ricky Persall. I think that could be a spot that if Roman Wilson's available there, that would be a nice landing spot. That second round wide receiver spot is one we want to keep an eye on because somebody could immediately step into the Deontay Johnson role. I don't see Calvin Austin like being the wide receiver two. I think he's a strong wide receiver three that can get downfield and more of a guy that would be a better in best ball or a stylistic player for an NFL offense rather than one we're ever going to use on our fantasy starting lineups. Was there any? Was Emmanuel Sanders a second round pick in real NFL draft? To also, guys, but he wasn't. Yeah. I think Manny he, Sanders. Manners. Don't quote me on this. I think he was a third rounder. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think he was third. All right. Uh, I, I will say one thing ab about uh, Calvin Austin and Emmanuel was a third rounder. Uh, Calvin Austin last year at camp, they like they clearly didn't want to push him into even the third role. He was competing with Allen Robinson for that third spot, but. He's the punt returner. He's a gadget guy, and I love me some Calvin Austin. I've loved him since he came out of Memphis, and, but he got healthy this past year, and they really just didn't want to press him into that third spot because he's just, like you said, he's a team-specific guy. So as far as fantasy goes and as far as dynasty goes, I, I, I don't think you can really – you know, you can go out and add him for free, sure. And if an injury does happen to whoever they do draft and Calvin's pushed into that role, targets are targets. But as far as expectation of wide receiver two, I think you can completely X that out. All right. We're about to take a short break here, guys. But lightning round, you get one word to answer this question. In Dynasty Fantasy Football, George Pickens or Chris Olave? Cody. Olave. Theo, Jalen Waddle or George Pickens from Dynasty? Jalen Waddle. All right, guys, let's take a short break here. We come back. We'll also talk about the free agency uh, fallout with the Tyler Lockett signing, the Baker Mayfield signing, and a whole bunch more. We'll be right back.
This episode is brought to you by Player Profiler, the Dynasty Deluxe Package. The rankings are the best in the industry. It includes strategy mode where you can say, hey, change the rankings to be win now. Oh, change the rankings to be productive struggle. There's also a draft planner to help to strategize where you should take players because the draft planner also includes ADP. There's a trade finder where we look up on my fantasy league and we see trades that are done, including a particular player. Then there's a trade analyzer where you can plug in draft picks, players, and we assign a lifetime value to draft picks out five years. The best thing about our trade analyzer, it can't be gamed with volume. And there's mock draft data to see right now, what's the market for player X versus player Y, including in the fall when very few mock drafts are happening. And our dynasty guide, the dynasty dominator would cost you 10 bucks on Amazon, but you get it for free with dynasty deluxe and you get our rookie guide for free, a $25 value. So you get all of that for 45 bucks. So I think it's a great deal. We're back with the Sonic Truth Dynasty Fantasy Focused Podcast. I'm Alan Sislowski of Rotowire.com, along with Theo Greminger. The, uh, well, I guess, what's your current role? You're the director of content of all things content, the godfather of content. I'm doing it all, Alan. Director okay. of content. Uh, but I want to give a shout out to, oh, to Cody oh, Carpentier okay. real quick yeah. because Cody is, uh, you know, we just saw an ad for the Dynasty Deluxe and that rookie guide that's starting to come into fruition. Like, I know you did your uh, write up for us on your guy, Keon Coleman, uh, but you're going to be able to get Cody's rankings, my rankings, Jax Falcone's rankings, along with Chalk of the Undroppables. You're going to be able to get Matty Kiewum's rankings and John Lobb's rankings and player write-ups for at least the top 50 and then some other really, really fun stuff in there. So that's coming along. That's one thing to uh, to look out for. But Cody, I don't, I don't think there's another spot you're going to find as many good, strong rankings all together in one rookie guide. I'm excited. I, when you brought it up to me, man, I was like, I guess I'm in. I guess I'm in. Yep. This is, I mean, the rookie guy has been something I spent a lot of time in the last couple of years. So I'm excited to to kind of get my toes wet again this year with it. All right, guys, uh, we'll continue on. I'm looking forward to that rookie guy as well. And as you've noticed, Cody Carpentier sitting in for the pod father. We'll see him back in a couple weeks. Uh, gentlemen, we are going to be talking rookie flag plants towards the end of this podcast. So if anyone uh, is looking forward to that, seeing what some of our, let's say, quote, sleepers, dart throws, guys that uh, we're standing by, even if they're early round picks, we'll talk about that later on. There's too much going on in Dynasty as related to free agency not to cover it right away. I think one of the bigger happenings was Tyler Lockett. He signs a uh, a two for thirty deal, basically assuring that he's going to be a heavily part of the game plan again for 2024 and maybe even 2025. Guys, Cody Carpentier, let's just get right to it. Jackson Smith and Jigba buy sell. What's his role going to be? Everyone spent their sixth pick in their rookie draft. He was the wide receiver one last year. What do they have on their roster right now? They have a really good wide receiver that I believe is still top twelve in dynasty. And I've seen some posts out there saying, you know, if he wasn't top, if he was top 25 before the locket news, and now you have not said the top 25 after the locket news, he was never top 25. But the, the problem is he's not top 25. He's top 12. This is the talent that we have right now. And I know people take this, this inherent thought of, oh, well, you know, last year we loved him and he, and he, and he shit the bed as a, as a rookie, get him out of here. That's not how this works. This guy is one of the better route runners in football. And he's still 22 years old. He's going to be 22 and a half, 22.6 by the time the season rolls around. Jackson Smith and Jigba has, he, he fits the archetype. He's six foot 196. He runs down there in the four fours. And just because the situation is the current situation, Lockett had a two, was a two year, 30 million. That's not a mega contract. There's a lot of people out there making 19 million that don't deserve it in the NFL right now. Lockett's 31 and a half. It, kind of interesting to say that he's currently projecting to maybe last longer in the NFL than Russell Wilson, who we just talked about. Maybe that's a little interesting one right there. Jackson Smith and Jigba, though, there's no reason to sell on a Jigba because the price you're going to sell for right now is not worth what you paid for him. And the, the stock shouldn't be going down. Again, like I said, 22 and a half years old. This guy's got at least 10 years in the bucket still. We'll see what they do at the quarterback position after Geno or if they just continue to roll with Geno for the next five years, whatever it may be. But I have no worries for Jackson Smith and Jigba. We saw it come along and come along and come along towards the end of the year last year, and I expect it to continue uh, in 2024. Theo, I try to offer somebody pick 109 for JSN. I'm still in on them here. It got rejected fast. Before I even clicked uh, send, it was rejected. It's amazing, Alan. They were able to hack in your trade offers. But 
Uh, you know, I, I, we don't like to prop guys up also because of, of uh, offensive systems, but you have to be excited about Ryan Grubbs. This was a, a, a coordinator hire that I thought was really, really strong uh, to see Seattle go ahead and get him. The success he had at Fresno State and then recently at the University of Washington, the passing numbers put up in those offenses and the balance towards the passing game uh, were really like, uh, you know, makes me very optimistic about the Seattle wide receivers returning value. We saw so much in the Pete Carroll years of getting like these random tight ends involved in the passing game, game in, game out. I think this could be a true three wide receiver set offense um, where you're going to see Jackson Smith and Jigba on the field a ton, along with Lockett and Metcalf. And like Cody said, this is a guy that we were betting on big time last year for you to go ahead and want to get rid of him off of your dynasty roster because of Tyler Lockett resigning. That's just not the right way to go about the game. And I think a couple of weeks ago, he was probably a hold, but I think today because the market reacting to the Lockett news, he is a player to buy. Alan, I think your offer of the one Oh nine in Superflex is going to get it done for JSN with a lot of dynasty managers today in a single QB league. I turned down an offer Somebody offered me 107 for for JSN. I turned that one down. But I think there are managers that are looking to get out, and they're worried about you know uh, him struggling to gain a massive uh, role increase. But Cody, this is also a guy that last year in JSN we saw him get surgery in the preseason. He missed a great deal of the preseason in addition to missing you know that final year at Ohio State. So he's dealt with some injuries. He's going to have a healthy off season this year at 22 years old. That matters a lot. Look at George Pickens last year. George Pickens had that healthy offseason. We saw him take a big step forward in year two. And I think JSN does the same thing, regardless of Tyler Lockett. Yeah, guys. I mean, he's he JSN is trending towards more of the of the dynasty mindset, calling him a bust for fantasy rather than him having optimism. I'm with you. I share the optimism, but if you are going to try to acquire him, I think this is this is the window to do. We always say this guy's a buy, but it's not like Everyone's a buy and a sell at the right price. It's the timing. I think that's what we need to start thinking about as fantasy managers. When is the right time to buy? When is the right time to sell? This happened with Deshaun Watson a couple of years ago, right? He was a buy and a sell depending on what part of the calendar. Another player with significant uh, impact on the fantasy football and in our super flex leagues, Baker Mayfield, not a surprise to me, three for uh, three years, 100 mil. This is how the contract goes, Cody. It goes 30 million, 30 million, 40 million, meaning the annual salary where the second year, 20 million guaranteed. So uh, what I believe is that this fit, you know, I call them the fake three year contract. This means that Baker is locked in most likely for two years. Now I say most likely because we just saw a team have 40 million of dead cap <laughs> with the Denver Broncos and everything's on the table at this point, but Baker Mayfield, former number one pick playing like a pretty good player in the NFL. And I still think good for fantasy. What do you think is Baker Mayfield now in the locked in top 15, top 20 quarterback for fantasy football, given also that Mike Evans is there as well for the next couple of years. You, you, so is that question top 15? Is that 2024? You're talking dynasty. I'm He's talking. Di I'm talking dynasty fantasy football. Where should Baker Mayfield, who, by the way, that market hates him, right? The market hates Baker yeah. Mayfield, but he does produce I, for fantasy football at least a reasonable super flex floor. Yeah, for me, it's he's right at that QB 22, 23 spot. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if I can quite push him up into that next tier there. Um, right around for me, it's right around you know Jared Goff, right around Kirk Cousins. Maybe I'm maybe I'm a little low on these guys, but I'm a little age biased. I don't I don't like the old guys. But Baker again, only 29, right behind Bryce, right behind two is kind of where I'm at uh, in dynasty at the quarterback position. But I like where Baker's uh, headed right now. And Mike Evans comes back. Godwin's obviously still there. They're spending resources uh, at positions to help Trey Palmer, Kate Otten, these middle round, not too late middle round guys that can really help uh, a quarterback move along. And they understand the protection. They understand building from the inside out on the offensive line, the defensive line. I think Tampa's doing everything right. And Baker deserved this contract more than a lot of people did in the NFL. You know, a lot of people deserve it, but Baker deserves it just based on what he's done the last couple of years and been able to grind through Cleveland, L.A., Carolina. And he's just he got the spot, took Tampa to the playoffs. He deserved this contract. 
Theo, we're talking about Baker Mayfield. He is the one that screams out as a value to me in our, you know, in our startup leagues. Uh, QB twenty two. I mean, he is like you said. Uh, Cody mentioned Bryce Young. Do you have any faith Bryce Young is is going to rebound given the situation he's in right now? I mean, if Bry- if Bryce Young can't rebound with Dave Canales as his head coach, then he's dust for his career. Similar to but what Baker did last year. Similar to what Baker did last right. year. Bingo. But- you know, the thing about Baker that's interesting is they gave him uh, a lot of rushing attempts last year. So that's something where this year you could see him take that next step, just kind of falling in the end zone three, four more times, uh, you know, adding a little bit more to his fantasy floor. I think Cody valued him correctly. I think that he's a mid to low end QB two, but he's locked right in that range, Alan. Last year, we saw him finish as a QB one. He has Mike Evans back, Rashad White. Uh, you know, that was a guy that they targeted heavily out of the backfield. And Cody, I'll throw out that if Baker didn't resign, I think they would have been in the mix for like the the, the Michael Penix, um, you know, the yep. Bo Nixes at that 26 overall pick. So I think that 26 overall, don't rule out them going wide receiver there. I know they're linked to edge rusher. They could add another defensive back. There's a lot of ways they could go. But with those two wide receivers getting older and this talented wide receiver group, you could see one of these, uh, you know, w- younger wide receiver, um, you know, in there to go along with Trey Palmer and Kate Otten to give support to Mike Evans in what could be a kind of underrated passing game. Hey, guys. So, I'll start. Go ahead, Cody. No, I was going to say, so would you take Baker or Bryce right now in Dynasty? Baker for me. This is not even close, I'm, guys. I'm going, I'm going Baker, and it's, yeah. it's, okay. it's wild. But, I mean, I just, uh, you know, we talk about weapons. We talk about what we've seen on the field. And it's hard for me to see Bryce taking that next step where I think – if I had to bet on one of them finishing as a low end QB one next year, Cody, it would be Baker Mayfield. That's fair. That's fair. What if um, there's a hypothetical here because we're in kind of hypothetical season? We're waiting for the draft, we're waiting for free agency, all these things. And you have to be able to project in Dynasty. Matty Keelum's mock just coming out today. He has the Carolina Panthers getting Troy Franklin in the second and Jatavian Sanders, the first pick in the third round. Would those two weapons give you a little more, uh, you know, breathing room or a little more trust in Bryce Young? Hey can guys, I, we kind of all them up there. I I, yeah. I like guys. I just want to jump in here. It doesn't matter what rookies you put in there. We know they don't have a first round pick, right? So it would have to be yeah. someone who fell to the second round. And yeah. say what you want about Adam Thielen, but the guy was good last year, and he just Bryce Young just did not look like he. All the things that that Theo and the Pod Father and you uh, Cody said negative about Bryce Young all showed up on the field, right, guys? So I think that Baker, who's actually done it, versus a guy who hasn't done it, we could weigh that age all we want, but at the end of the day. Um, if we're talking about who's going to score more fantasy football points over the next two years, or put it this way, all right, who's going to have more more rest of career starts, Baker or Bryce Young? Mm. I'll call it a tie because of the age discrepancy, and also if Bryce Young flames out of Carolina, <laughs> someone's going to take another chance on him. I, I just or like they will on Zach Wilson, right? You know what? You, you, you know what? I. I think I take Baker in that. Me too. I'm, a, I'm just gonna be honest with you. And I love Bryce, and I'm not writing the ship. I'm not the ship isn't sailed on Bryce Young. I no. think Canales is good for him. I think that they'll bring weapons in. But you're talking about Baker outside of injury, guaranteed at least 32 starts the next two years. It feels like, mm. and I think Baker's a guy that can continue to hold. He's 29, man. He, this guy yeah. could play for legit 10 more years. You're talking upwards of 70, 80, 90 potential. This is a big number, but potential starts for a guy that we already know can do it. And he I think go, Baker, right? And Baker can go the Andy Dalton route once he's done Bingo. starting. Right? He could, you know, bridge to a, a rookie quarterback on another team. Well, here's a question for both you both. That's a sick what question. Rookie, what rookie pick would you send if you're trying to get Baker Mayfield? If you're talking about super flex rookie picks, 2024 yeah. picks, Alan. I would trade J.J. McCarthy for him, whatever pick that is, and expect to get more than just Baker Mayfield back. I would expect to get the guys, you know, because J.J. McCarthy is going to be a hot name, right? He's going to be a top 10 pick. And if I want Baker Mayfield, you got to give me J.J. McCarthy when you're on the clock at pick eight or nine, or he might even move up to seven, right? Plus something else that I feel like a useful running back or a, you know, a George Pickens or something like that. You're greedy, Alan. You're greedy, Alan. Well, yeah. because the market perception is going to be what you guys just said. No one's going to be like, oh, my God, I have to get Baker Mayfield. But when you actually think about it, he's one of the safer super flex guys. I, yeah, I'm probably at the. I'm probably at like 111. I would yeah. trade my 111 
to get Baker, which I'm saying for me, for me, that's Penix, that's Brooks, that's Benson. That gets to that tier right there. I would, I would trade my 111 to get him. Yep. Uh, if I have Baker, though, yeah, I might press and be like, hey, hey give me that 108, baby. Give me it. I, I did a dynasty um, startup with a, a few of the guys over at South Harmon. And when I took Baker on the 5 6 turn, they all scoffed at me. This is like a month ago. Um, I just thought it was like, you know, I took. I was like, "Who else are you going to take?" The quarterbacks run out right after that. It's all question mark, guys. So yeah. I, I'm going to be bullish on Baker, not because I think, like you said, he could be top five, but certainly is safe to be top fifteen for fantasy football, guys. Let's let's keep moving on here. Theo, we'll start with you here. Mac Jones gets traded for a six round pick over to back up Trevor Lawrence in the Jaguars. Is there any fantasy football outcome of the uh, uh, takeaway from this stuff? Uh, not, not really any, any fantasy football takeaway, but I do think it's a smart pickup by Jacksonville to go out and get a younger quarterback who's had starts in the NFL, who's seen how valuable the backup, the backup quarterback position is, and they paid hardly anything and they end up with Mac Jones. So it's not somebody that's get everybody excited, but there's been an absolute train wreck of backup quarterbacks on a number of NFL teams. Jacksonville is a team that's, uh, you know, views themselves as a contender for their division. <laughs> They view themselves as a playoff team, and they get a backup that if they had to get two weeks of Mac Jones next year, I don't think that would scare them. Yeah. Cody, uh, does this really mean that the Patriots are locked into taking a quarterback at number three? Yeah, um, unless unless they are sneaky in the Kirk Cousins conversation, which we'll find out hopefully in the next hour. All right, because they did go after Russ, right? You you mentioned at the top of the hour they went after Russ. They made a little angle at him. Now again, I know the mo the money's going to be a little different between that you know min for for Russ and the max for Kirk Cousins, but the Patriots do have money, so I think it's either going to be Kirk or a rookie, like you brought up. Well, or or they could take you know a second round pick if you know Bo Nix, Michael Penix, those guys fall to the yep. early second round as well. Very interesting there. All right, so but in as far as Trevor Lawrence, this doesn't affect anything with him, Cody. Yeah, no. Um, these guys have been competing dating back to high school, uh, have Lawrence and Mac Jones, and I think this is only going to benefit. Uh, it's probably going to bring some confidence back to Mac because he's used to the competition. Obviously, he played against T-Law in the national championship. They played a bunch. Bama Clemson, they played in high school against each other in these in these rivals camps and stuff like that. So it's going to bring some moxie and some juice back to Mac, which is only going to uh, help Trevor Lawrence grow and it's going to help Mac Jones grow, help, help Mac Jones grow. And it's going to uh, really give them a better backup, just like Theo brought up. And the 2021 uh, quarterback class is down bad right now, Alan, the 21, <laughs> 2021 quarterback class needs Trevor Lawrence to ball out this year. Yeah. Um, don't, don't write off um, Zach Wilson either. Right. I mean, I saw some teams there. I mean, Zach Wilson, again, I, I, yeah, listen, go ahead. I, I got some words for you. if the Vikings take, I'm not even going to say it. This is Sam Donald, Zach Wilson thing. I'm not even going to say it if that's what happens in Minnesota. Meaning like all the Jets cast off stuff. Sam Darnold or Zach Wilson to Minnesota as the give starter. Both. Is, both. No, give me neither. How about, how about you ship them to? It, it's No. Yeah, I want no part of that. You yeah, want to talk about yeah. wasteland. You want to talk about nuking dynasty upside for Addison, Jefferson. Hot. Go home. Yeah. couple pieces of wide receiver news, guys. Uh, Michael Pittman gets the extension. He's going to be an indie, uh, you know, rock solid contract for a, um, you know, an alpha wide receiver. He's going to be there. Fine. Move on. T Higgins has his franchise tag now is requesting a trade. All right. Let's let's get into the, the psychology of this. And also there's going to be some dynasty implications here, Theo. So T Higgins is just is he going to be traded, meaning like is this make even any sense for Cincinnati? And if so, I think it's going to give them to a team like the Panthers. I mean, they're not going to trade them to a team where they're competing to in the AFC. It makes no sense to me. But why would they trade him? Like we see these things get worked out time in time again, where a player comes out and says something. And then we end up seeing, you know, the, the teams, you know, kind of work it out. They'll give T Higgins a little bit more money. Uh, you know, we saw the whole Saquon Barkley thing last year and then things worked out. I don't see any benefit to Cincinnati trading away T. Higgins. Cincinnati is not that far removed from the Super Bowl. They have all this money in Joe Burrow. They are banking on their passing game, and they're going to give up T. Higgins, where if they give up T. Higgins in a trade, they're going to have to use the picks that they receive on a wide receiver, yep. or they're going to have to select a wide receiver in the first round. 
they're not going to be able just going to re- be able to replace T. Higgins with Yoshivas straight up. Yoshivas is going to be like a Gabe. It, listen, Cody's Cody's crossing his arms here. You know, back up your guy Yoshivas. I like Yoshivas a lot, but I like Yoshivas as the wide receiver three next to T. Higgins and Jamar Chase as a yeah. as a Tyler Boyd replacement. Yes, they right. yeah, and, and they're losing Boyd too. So I don't see since I think Cincinnati is going to make up with T Higgins. They're certainly not going to trade him to another AFC contender, which all these people are saying like, you know, T Higgins to Kansas city or something like that. They're going to move him. It would be to the NFC. So they're already limiting the teams they would trade with. They're not going to give him to Jacksonville. They're not going to give him to well, Kansas city. It's not going to happen. It would be pick 33 to the Panthers, right? That would be the obvious trade there. Yeah. But I still think I would prefer T Higgins mm-hmm. and I think Cincinnati would prefer T Higgins. And uh, I think that they'll get things worked out. If it is pick 33, it does become interesting for us as dynasty managers because if they do decide to use that first round pick on a wide receiver or Allen, they trade up just a few spots and get Brock Bowers. That becomes a great landing spot for that rookie. But in terms of you know Cincinnati having to use those draft picks on a wide receiver or try to you know get things right with T. Higgins, I think the latter is probably the 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 most reasonable outcome. New England, Cody, Tennessee. go ahead. New England, you Tennessee. Know. That's the only other two I would bring up. New England's at 34. Tennessee is at 38. Um, but Tennessee also is at seven. And there's, you know, some maneuver some maneuvering you could make to uh allow Cincinnati to get up to that seven spot potentially. And then that opens up the I'm not saying it's a one for one where they just trade away T. Higgins and give up the seventh pick, and, and then all of a sudden Cincinnati drafts, you know, Roma Dunze or something, but there's so there's opportunity there to move up, but um, remember the Callahan connection between Cincinnati and Tennessee. So those are the two AFC teams I would bring up because they both have a boatload of money and they both need uh, a big wide receiver on the outside. So I think those are two options, but it does definitely feel like T Higgins is on the outs. Like it, this was rumored, you know, up a year and a half ago. And then it was like, you know, Jamar Chase is like, man, we love each other. He's coming back. Da 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 da. da. But you know what? The bottom line, the NFL is a business. Yeah. It's all a business dollars. Our dollars, 24, 25, 26 million dollars, big dollars. We're talking. This is big business. And you know, to have a half a billion dollar quarterback like Joe Burrow, you get kind of have to, you know, roll with Andre Yosevash every once in a you, while. You know, this is exactly why Kobe Bryant was signed to the max when he went towards Achilles, because not because he was going to give him the production, because it's a business. Kobe Bryant was able to fill the LA forum when he came back as a compromised player shooting under 30%. That's the reason. So your, your point is valid there. T. H- the re- uh, Thea, I just wanted to answer your question there. In my judgment, the reason why T. Higgins would probably request a change is they see the uh, franchise tag as an insult, right? Yeah, you you don't want sure. to invest in me. You don't like me enough. You don't th- value me enough. So they see it as an insult at the wide receiver position. I think running backs have come around that they understand that that is just what's going to happen. No, I think, I think you're probably correct on that. I can understand the T. Higgins camp being very upset about their situation. Uh, This is a guy that would be valued as the wide receiver one on probably 12 NFL teams right away. Uh, So I I could see him wanting to go elsewhere. I just think that these things don't always happen. You know, it's these, these wide receivers that are this age, you know, we've seen these guys get traded in the past with like the AJ Browns and people always point at those things, but that's still a rare occurrence. And and I I don't think it's going to happen. All right, guys. Uh, Jerry Judy uh, changed teams, gets moved over to the Cleveland Browns for two day three picks. Now, pretty interesting here because uh, had Jerry Judy played out this year and then walked in free agency, true free agency, they would have received a compensatory third round pick. So they're actually getting getting cash now, quote, you know, getting paid now those two day three picks versus a, a round three pick. But this, uh, the, the Denver Denver management could be on the hot seat. They need picks now and players now with those picks. So starting over with Cody here, Jerry Judy to the Cleveland Browns, sort out the wide receiver hierarchy for me and who I should and shouldn't be interested in. Uh, Jerry Judy, I'm good. 25 years old, I'm good. Uh, Very good route runner. We knew that coming out, but he has uh, his issues. Um, There's clearly something that's, you know, not visible um, because he's had numerous opportunities to become the true number one. He's missed out on a thousand yards very narrowly um, in in Denver one time, but he hasn't been able to become the alpha. He he seems to not be fully there. You know, I don't want to, you know, point fingers at like locker room stuff, but he just doesn't seem to be fully engaged in, in, you know, getting to that 
Stephon Diggs tier, that conversation to be an elite wide receiver. So he's coming over here and he's going to be competing with an Amari Cooper, who we've seen dominate multiple times in multiple offenses. <laughs> Elijah Moore, who's a bona fide dog in the slot. And then, of course, you have the, you know this guy in the tight end position that has uh, come along very quickly the last couple of years. Uh, and his name is uh, David Njoku. So there's opportunities there. Deshaun Watson should be back. We know prime Deshaun Watson would be able to get the ball to each and every one of these guys, but you're competing for targets with a bunch of dogs. And Jerry Judy, I think, is a bona fide kitty cat at this stage. He's got five 100-yard games in his career, Alan. It's just not a guy that has ever made that sort of impact where I think he's going to go over to a new team and just have this big career renaissance. This has sort of been par for the course for Cleveland. They're officially like the transfer portal uh, wide receiver uh, grouping in the NFL. Elijah Moore, second round pick by the Jets, gets traded for for you know not that much, but more than they gave it for Judy. We see Judy go over there, first round pick uh, by Denver, gets traded, uh, and they give up pretty much nothing. And Amari Cooper, of course, was traded uh, from from Dallas over to Cleveland. So now they have all these traded wide receivers. It's sort of what they're doing. It's interesting because their entire offense is going to be guys that were first or second round picks when you put in David Njoku and you put in a healthy Nick Chubb. Uh, how effective that offense is going to be uh, remains to be seen. But again, I think Judy, if anything, it makes me less interested in Elijah Moore in terms of a guy that we could potentially rely on taking a big step forward. It certainly doesn't do any, it, it's certainly not a good thing if you believed in Cedric Tillman taking a year two jump. But in terms of doing anything to Amari Cooper or David Njoku in their uh, you know, fantasy value, I don't think so at all. I agree with Cody. Guys, Amari Cooper, he he belongs in this um, tier for Dynasty Fantasy Football with Keenan Allen and Mike Evans, guys that just keep producing that everybody writes off and you always have they're they're always amongst the the league leaders and helpful for fantasy. So uh, I don't think this affects Amari Cooper at all. This does, uh, I believe, at least give Deshaun Watson another you know, baseline professional NFL receiver. But I think that we get excited about these guys who fail in one place and then go to another. Uh, I'm not going to really be drafting Judy, even if, um, even if he does have a couple productive games. Uh, the other thing is, do you remember Jerry Judy, uh, Cody with that, uh, that blow up with Steve Smith where he was a little off the, off the chain that that was wild as well, Cody. That's what I'm saying. It's just like these weird things where you generally would see these alpha wide receivers. Like I brought up Diggs, I brought up Jefferson chase, all these guys that's just going to act different in those situations and are also dominant on the field, have good communication with their quarterback. These are all things we haven't seen uh, with Judy with multiple quarterbacks, multiple offensive coordinators. Now, again, that's another something that's made it tough on him is having multiple quarterbacks and multiple coordinators and coaches. But it's just, you know, being a professional in the space. And this is just kind of one of those things where it's just eh, it's doesn't doesn't look right right now. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, I promise rookie flag plants are coming. Just stick with us here, but there's too much going on in dynasty fantasy football as it relates to these, these veterans that are getting uh, signing and rumored and, and changing teams. So we're going to stick with that for now. Uh, another, another piece uh, still major piece to fall is this Kirk cousins things guys. Okay. Theo um, didn't, you know, he, he's going to hit free agency. He's going to explore the market here. I would call it a favorite to land in Atlanta. And for a couple of easy reasons here, one indoors, right? And number two, uh, at least that they would, um, that he, he's not going to play right away. <laughs> Obviously he's recovering from an Achilles, but also that seems like the most winnable division in football right now, as far as like competition relative to the Atlanta Falcons, that team with him on it. Yeah. I mean, it's the Tom Brady path of going to the NFC South on a team that has a strong defense and some very exciting weapons on offense that, you know, he has a Drake London, he has a Bijan Robinson, certainly uh, Kyle Pitts, you think would see a bump with Kirk Cousins. I, I mean, I would love the fit. All of my Drake London dynasty shares would love it. Um, and certainly like the Kyle Kyle Pitts people would, would be ecstatic. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it's Minnesota or Atlanta. Um, I, I see that the, the, you know, you say Atlanta is like the, the heavy favorite, I don't know. Cody, you bring up some of those horrible names associated with Minnesota. That can't be their plan. Their plan has to be getting things right with Kirk Cousins over the next few hours and trying to work things out. But if not, I agree with you, Alan. I think Atlanta's the most logical destination and an exciting one. 
Cody, before you jump in here, Kirk Cousins is one of the most wealthy quarterbacks in the NFL. He's going to make this decision, I believe, based on where he wants to be. He wants to be paid. He's expecting to be paid top of market no matter where he goes at this point. Money, 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 money. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's money, baby. And that's something he's made clear since leaving Washington. It's all about the money. And yes, he's happy in Minnesota, and I think he fits Minnesota well. So this is a thought. I, I talked to Alex about this on Friday as we did a little bit of a free agent primer. And the one source that I really trust in Minnesota, when he says, you know, Kirk's gone, I believe him. When he says Kirk's staying, I believe him. He said, we're not going to see Kirk in purple. But over the weekend, you heard more and more things a little bit come out. And when Ziggy Wilf, who's one of the most respected owners in the sport, is starting to enter those conversations, he's not like the cat down in Carolina. He doesn't overstep his boundaries, but he knows what's important and he knows what the, the, the most important part of an offense is or a team I should say is the quarterback and having that quarterback and he's willing to jump in there and say you know what I'll give him another five million because we want Kirk to be here it seems like that conversation was had this weekend just based on some things we've seen come out so again we're literally a few minutes away live from for uh, free agency tampering opening and I think there's going to be a, a, a land a, a, a you know a flow of stuff coming in it would not shock me in the lightest. And if you would ask me on Friday, I would have said 70%. I thought Kirk was going to the Falcons right now. I think I'm more back towards 50-50 and even a little bit leaning towards Kirk being back in Minnesota. All right, guys. Another quarterback that this affects is Justin Fields. And what the trade, his trade market has stalled out completely. I mean, you, you never know exactly what's going on, but the message that the Bears are getting back from teams, they, they don't consider Justin Fields to be much more of a sure thing. And I put that in air quotes more than Sam Darnold or even Drew Locke. Now, that could be a negotiating ploy, Theo Greminger, but. I mean, when you think about it, we love Justin Fields, his fantasy football upside, but it, has he done much more than any of those quarterbacks or any of the other free agent quarterbacks that are out there? What do you think is going to be? Is this going to be musical chairs and the Bears are going to be stuck with this guy on their roster? The market is, seems to be dead for Justin Fields right now. 10 and 28 as a starter. Uh, and I think that scares a lot of NFL teams off. For us in fantasy football, we look at him as a guy who continually puts up QB1 numbers. But the NFL teams are not like that. I mean, but it's so weird that the market would value a guy like Sam Darnold equally as Justin Fields, if you're going to believe those sort of reports. I think that a week from now, after we see a few of these, a few of these landing spots determined, now that we've seen Russell Wilson, we're going to see Kirk Cousins. Uh, we saw Baker Mayfield resign. I think a week from now, the market could open up a little bit more for Justin Fields, but I don't think we're going to see anything certainly today. Um, I don't think it's going to be early this week. I think it's going to be, you know, let the chips fall and then teams sort of adjust. And some team might say, hey, I'm going for Justin Fields. There's also could be a market after the NFL draft where certain teams think that they're going to position themselves to get one of these appealing 2024 rookie QBs. If that doesn't happen, I think that Justin Fields could be appealing to those sort of teams as well. What more has Justin Fields done? in the NFL than Mac Jones. Right. Scored fantasy points for me on my roster. Yep. And that think, means negative to the NFL, right? Exactly. So Mac Jones just was traded for a sixth round pick. Mac Jones, same draft, higher draft pick. Draft picks don't really matter at this stage. But in 40 career games, Justin Fields, 10 and 28, 40 touchdowns, 30 picks. 42 career games for Mac Jones, 46 touchdowns, 30 picks. He won 18. So technically, if we're looking at the statistics, the straightforward statistics, it's telling us that Mac Jones is currently the better quarterback. Now, again, there's a rushing element to this that Justin Fields bring a little dynamism to the, to the field. But you could make an argument that if one of these guys is going to pan out, it might be having a Mac Jones who's a more NFL prototype quarterback on your team, and you can kind of teach him some of these things where Fields – you know what I'm saying here? Sixth round pick. And right. we heard just a couple weeks ago, even there was there was conversations in Indianapolis about second and a fourth, third and a fourth. That's about where we're at. A lot of con I mean, Rick Spielman brought it up on the CBS pod that he does every week. Second and a fourth, that's that's about right. And you would have thought that would have been done by now. If Chicago could have got that, they would have done it. We haven't yeah. heard it, we haven't seen it. And now we see Mac go for a sixth. What are we to say? That that's not exactly what Justin goes for. Maybe it's a fifth, something like that. Sixth, seventh. That's so, the range we're looking at right now. They just told us it this morning. 
you know, so what you're saying is that he's going to be Lamar Jackson's backup, right? In uh, in, in the Ravens for a fourth round pick. I'm, I'm making a joke. I still think that there's teams that would view Justin Fields as a starter. There's a perception difference on these guys, right, Theo? I turned down in a single QB dynasty uh, league a few weeks back. I got offered Josh Downs for Justin Fields. And it was like a reasonable offer, but I was like, you know, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to see what happens with Justin Fields when he lands elsewhere, maybe gets a bump. Um, and I, I sort of wish I took that. That uh, Josh that Downs, field. that's low. That's, that's low. It's low. It's single QB, though, and I have CJ Stroud, so it was yeah. not a uh, a necessity. Right. But and know, single, it, yeah. yeah. And then single QB, I mean, you, you want Fields, right? Because he's one of yeah. the few difference-making quarterbacks, right, Cody? If he's yeah. on the field. Send, send Fields to Arizona. Put him behind Kyler. How about that? Yeah. We shall see, guys. That's definitely one of the more interesting storylines here. A couple other veterans that I want to um, get into the discussions here. Um, I mean, call this note what you will, but it says Aaron Rodgers wants to play two to four more years. If you're drafting Aaron Rodgers in a startup or trading for him in any sort of you know QB heavy format, you got to figure obviously 24 guaranteed. And I think 25 is a reasonable projection for him. Two more years, uh, Theo? Yeah, I think that seems about right. Cody, you you would operate under the assumption of two more seasons for Aaron Rodgers. I think two is pretty fair, as we know how he moves. It's every every, every he's met, he's mentioned this multiple times on McAfee. Every single offseason, he takes everything into account. So I think two seems fair, but I wouldn't be again. You know, the four thing is what it is. All right, let's chalk this next topic up to the uh, world of boring free agents. But I love this kind of stuff. Kendrick Bourne. Signs are three for 33 deal. He was actually good and useful for fantasy guys. So Cody, I'll start with you this time right here. Kendrick Bourne. Um, this has been a critiqued signing by the new England Patriots calling it an overpay, but you know, I mean, this is what the 11 million a year, this is what these players cost. 11 million a year. They, well, they didn't pay him 20. They didn't, they didn't pay him 20 million a year. That's right. The point. Three, it, three it for 33. They also have an abundance of money, and I'm not saying that that should mean you should overpay by any means. But Kendrick Bourne finally caught a touchdown pass. Uh, what was it? A couple, you know, one in the last three years, maybe. I'm just kidding. Anyway, I, I do think it's fine. They they just need they straight up need depth. They need people that know the system, know the offense, know the team, and you know whatever. I don't. I mean, this is a this is a zero for me. I mean, he's outside of my top, you know, 125 in dynasty wide receiver, and he's 29 years old. So he's a zero for me if we're talking about that aspect of it. But it, New England needs receivers. It's the first time in the history of the Sonic Truth podcast that uh, Kendrick Bourne is receiving any sort of conversation. It makes what Indianapolis just paid Michael Pittman look like a great, great, great bargain when you compare it to the market for a guy like Kendrick Bourne and a guy like like Michael Pittman. It's it doesn't move anything needle wise. I think that Cody nailed it. Experienced yeah. wide receiver, Jared. Only Mayo the deepest. The I mean, listen. A lot of dynasty players that listen to the Sonic Truth podcast, they're in these formats where there's three receivers, four flex. He's a player at least you could shove into your lineup in the hopes he gets you a five for fifty five. That's very useful. But other than that, so Good. if you had him and you were holding him because he was injured last year, this just means you're not cutting him, right, Theo? That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, he's he's just on your roster. He's a roster right. clogger. Right. Well, I mean, again, depending on format, but yes, in the FFPC where it's two receivers, two flex, he will not be on your roster. So that's the, I think we covered that. All right, guys, I just saw a note uh, uh, on over the weekend that talked about that the Chargers were thinking about trading both Mike Williams and Keenan Allen, Theo. I, I think it's going to be a lot of new faces in Los Angeles next year. The Keenan Allen just might not make sense on this team. Uh, you know, his trade value is going to be a lot less a year from now than it is this year coming off of wide receiver one production at his age. And if they're not going for it this year, and this is sort of a transition year, then I think that it makes total sense for them to move Keenan Allen. And I think there'll be a big market of teams that want to go out and get Keenan Allen, especially after Mike Evans re-signing, especially after Michael Pittman re-signing, and who knows what's going to happen with T. Higgins. Keenan Allen can still help a lot of teams this year, but I think it's the the nature of the Harbaugh offense and the nature of kind of the transition we're seeing. There might be a situation where there is a rookie running back and a rookie wide receiver in Los Angeles that we really want for our dynasty teams. I think that that could absolutely happen. It would make total sense for them to use the fifth overall pick on a wide receiver and then use their third pick, third round pick on a running back. I do think Harbaugh is uh, kind of a, a interesting guy. I think they might go offensive lineman at five overall, and that that dream might die for us. But if they get 
a Malik Neighbors or a Roma Dunze at the 105, then that player could be targeted 140, 150 times in their rookie season if Cody, he now oh, moves on. Yep. Cody, does this give any optimism for, no. you know, I'm about to go with this. Is Quentin Johnson dead? Or if, let's say, both of those receivers, those veteran receivers are not on the roster, presumably, like Theo said, they'll take a receiver at five, but they need Quentin, Quentin Johnson to work. Does this put him? Does this resuscitate him? Like you remember the meme where the Frankenstein uh, uh, Dracula comes out of his coffin, right? That that famous chiff. Does that is that Quentin Johnson? If both of those guys move on, well, you said Quinston Johnson. I mean, Quinston ago, Johnson. There's probably a good cha good chance that Quinston Johnson gets a better opportunity because Quinston Johnson hasn't gotten an opportunity yet. But <laughs> Quinton no, I'm Johnson. Just <laughs> Quint yeah, I got no. I know. I'm just teasing. Quinton Johnson. Though I think there's opportunity for him, of course, especially if they move on from a Mike and from a Keenan Allen. 100%. And if they did in this crazy hypothetical, you know, bring in a Brock Bowers or a Roma Dunze, and all of a sudden, you know, Quinton is the bona fide number two. And I, I don't want to write off what QJ is. He brings a lot to the table. It's just the inconsistencies that he has. And building an entire offseason, which we've talked about a ton with these receivers, mainly the receiver position and quarterback position, but going from year one to year two as a rookie, these guys, the offseason doesn't exist as a rookie. Going into year two is a lot of opportunity for him to decide if he wants to be a Jerry Judy or decide if he wants to be a Stephon Diggs. And he will go find that quarterback, Justin Herbert, if he wants to be a Stephon Diggs. Or he'll sit back and he'll just you know be stuck in the ways that he was and he'll be the Jerry Judy of the situation. And we're going to learn that really quickly. We're going to learn uh, with the offseason drumbeat whether he's which, which kind of space he's sitting in. So I'm not writing him off per se. I'm definitely not in on him or high on him at this current stage because I haven't seen anything to be in or high on him. But I don't think he's uh, dead at this point. And I do think if they traded both these pieces, it, it would open up some more opportunities, of course, with just pure targets. Hey, guys, just uh, Theo, before we move on here, I uh, just want to let everybody know if you love uh, Cody Carpentier and want and, and want to hear more takes like that on the Sonic Truth podcast, you could let us know that by hitting that like button, right? That lets us know that you love Cody, that you want to see him on more episodes of the Sonic Truth podcast. Um, so hit that like button. Help. That's the, our only ask if you're watching this right now on live on any of the player profiler streams. All right. Running back time, guys. Free agency. Theo Greminger. Uh, it's it's going to be a lot of times these guys just go back to their own teams, right? Like Josh Jacobs resigns a basically a one year deal with the Raiders. That didn't happen. I'm saying that's usually what we see. But the, the Saquon Barkley is the interesting one because I think he is in a free agency tier by himself. What we're seeing is that there's teams like Chicago interested. We've heard Philly uh, uh, bandied about. The one team we didn't hear is the one we want to hear, Houston. So let's talk Saquon Barkley to the Chicago Bears for a minute here. And the reason I say that, you know where I'm going with this. A player profiler favorite was Roshan Johnson. They all The Bears also have Khalil Herbert. Barkley to uh, the Bears, hypothetically, what would that do for Dynasty Fantasy Football? It would be... It would be awful for for Roshan Johnson because <laughs> Roshan Johnson uh, showed us that he could catch the football uh, in the NFL. That was his big takeaway last year was not any sort of rushing volume, but he has the size and the receiving ability that he's right now kind of an interesting best ball pick and like the 11th round on like underdog 10th round on underdog and a guy in that wide in that running back three range that you could see take a step forward. If Chicago goes out and gets a Saquon Barkley or a Josh Jacobs, and I saw in the chat uh, Schefter's now saying they're interested in DeAndre Swift, it's not a, a great thing at all for, for Roshan. I think the pathway for Roshan would be a handcuff if they move on from Khalil Herbert. But if it's Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson on like cheap contracts with a, you know, a, a running back that's had a lot of success in the league as the RB1, it's a terrible thing uh, for, for fantasy football. I mean, yeah, for, and, for, you know, for especially for Roshan. Yeah, and uh, I'm just ref Cody referencing what uh, Adam, what Theo brought uh, to light about Adam Schefter's tweet that they're going to go after DeAndre Swift. Now we're just back in a three man committee, presumably with Roshan, Khalil Herbert. By the way, who was really good last year when he played? Yeah, and his and the year before and the year before. So uh, DeAndre Eberflus e Eberflus just doesn't seem to like Herbert. Yeah, you know, like you said, <laughs> Alan, we watch these games where Herbert gets a full load. And he rips off like a 50-yard touchdown. And then the next week, it's back to like being in the mix. All right. So Theo outlined what would happen with Roshan. What happens with DeAndre Swift, Cody? I mean, he is a, you know, he's being traded as like a top 15 running back in Dynasty Fantasy Football. Does this 
you know, does that factor in his floor upside uh, quotation, uh, 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 his upside and his floor together? I, I feel fine about Swift. I'd like to see Swift go back to Philly. Um, but again, they have a lot of sort and they have a lot of self uh, evaluation to do at the running back at, the, at the, every position, really. Uh, but Swift in Chicago, which Schefter says they're expected to make a major push to land for agent DeAndre Swift. Um, we'll see. I'm very interested in that dynamic in that offense because he does bring a, you know, Roshan's got a good burst, a good acceleration, great tackle breaking, but Swift does bring a thing that I think these two would work very well off of each other. If they do bring in Swift, I would say, I'm sure Khalil Herbert's probably on the outs in this situation. Um, but for me, I've never been in on DeAndre Swift until last August. And at, at that point last August, I had him as running back nine in Dynasty, which is the highest I've ever had him. And that was kind of when everyone was coming down on him. I felt good about it. I feel fine about it. I have him at 15 right now overall. He's still 25 years old. He's the youngest out of all of these you know, top-end running backs in free agency. So I, I do not love the Bears landing spot for him, but I do love it for the Bears to have a duo of Roshan and Swift. I just wanted to add one more thing in here because you brought up Saquon a minute ago and Deanna Rossini actually tweeted this out just a second after Schefter. She said the Eagles and Texans are expected to have the strongest interest in Saquon Barkley. Which makes I'll, sense. I'll add, I'll, I'll add for Swift. One last point on Swift was, uh, Cody, you know, you brought up going back to Philly and that was sort of my initial lean because he had 230 carries last year, which was a career high. But the one thing about Swift that would be very appealing with a rookie QB like Caleb Williams is the targets deandre yep. swift's a guy that can be a 65 catch guy next year and he was down to 49 total targets in philly it was just not something that the philadelphia offense did checking down to swift uh screen passes for swift those were just not something they did you could <laughs> see chicago with a rookie quarterback in a in a high passing volume offense use him as a receiver out of the backfield and make him more of a two-way back than what we saw in Philly. So I, I'm kind of intrigued by this one. And yeah, I mean, Philly and uh, and Houston for Saquon, those both both make sense a lot, Alan. Although, you know, Philly running back has not been like a fantasy fruitful position, hasn't been like an elite level producer for, for some time. But the uh, Saquon, you know, went to Penn State. Uh, is he from that area too, guys? Is he He's from like an hour away. He's from yeah. like central, central Jersey. So and close enough. Okay. Oh, he's a New Jersey guy. Okay. So yeah. yeah, no, that would be that seems to me that's gonna make the most sense. He's still in that same division. Get the revenge games against the Giants, right, guys? All right. It's time to talk about some rookie flag plants. If anything else comes in our free agency, I'm sure the player profiler network of shows will cover it during the day uh and throughout uh tweeting. All right, rookie flag plants. And what do we mean by that? NFL draft hasn't happened, but there's there's players. I mean, we've been we've been looking at these guys. I mean, you guys have been studying them for a long time. I, I've gotten on the rookie train in the last uh, you know thirty days or so. But guys that already we're attaching ourselves to that we're probably a little bit biased towards here, and uh, they could be sleeper picks, guys. They could be you know guys that go in the early rounds. So why don't we each just briefly just go over one guy who we're going to be probably a little biased towards, and we're going to call them rookie flag pants. I'm going to start over with Theo Graminger, who's a player that you're just going to be, as of right now, the most excited to draft and probably making an irrational case for on social media. Well, I've been willing to overpay to get into that top four uh, in my single QB leagues. I think it's truly a special top four. I'm not going to flag plant a bunch of guys that we love, um, but I am willing to overpay right now to get into that Roma Dunze Malik Neighbors, Brock Bowers tier in that pick 102 to 104 range. Certainly guys that I want to have as much exposure to as possible. But one guy that I think has a great combination of profile, draft capital, and then where I'm going to have to spend a pick for them in my rookie draft is Lad McConkey. I think Lad McConkey could end up landing in a spot where he has a pathway to multiple wide receiver two seasons, and he it just eats in the slot a guy that you just set it and forget it, plug him on your fantasy team, and he gives you these you know, 12 to 15 point uh, PPR seasons. This is a guy that I think at the end of the day, Alan, is going to be drafted in the first round of the NFL draft. But because the position is so strong and because the running back position, I think, is trending upward, I don't think Lad McConkey's ever going to be a, the guy, a kind of guy that I have to use like a top nine pick in single QB uh, leagues. 
And in super flex leagues, he's going to live right at that one, two turn where when he falls into the early second round, Lad McConkey is going to be an absolute value for us in super flex. Definitely a we, flag plant for me. Yeah. We were doing a draft. The three of us are in a rookie mock draft between Rotowire, roster watch player profiler and Lad McConkey went pick uh 2.2 in our super flex yeah. tight end premium draft. So that seems like uh right in line with what you said there. Um, Cody, before I ask your flag plant, do you share his uh, Theo sentiment and optimism about McConkie? I, I wouldn't say I'm as high on Lad as he is. I, I talk to Alex every day, and Alex is in the same boat as Theo. He loves some Lad McConkie. Fell in love with him down there at the Senior Boys. One of the most sudden uh, best route runners in the class. Alex thinks he's the best, and I, I think Lad's going to be very successful. I have my worries about what he brings to the table from an injury standpoint. A lot of hip, knee, back, all these injuries that happened at Georgia, but I still think he's going to be very successful in the NFL. Yeah, I, I, for some reason, I've already locked into my brain that he's picked 33 to the Panthers if they don't <laughs> trade that. Or so. uh, okay, yeah. um, you, uh, before we close, did you have anything else you wanted to add before I move on, uh, Theo? No, I, I agree okay. with you. I think that that's like the floor for him is pick 33 and pick 34. Okay. One of those two spots, those teams are not passing him up. All right, Cody, you heard, you know, you understand what a flag plan is now. Who's somebody that you're going to be irrationally biased towards? Breaking news, Alan. We'll break the news. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but the Bears are signing DeAndre Swift per Tyler Knabel. Three years, $24 million for, for DeAndre Swift. So we're going to start seeing these running backs fall into the place. If you're listening to the show on, on delay, you probably know a bunch of other ones. But if you're watching it live, we want to report that one. DeAndre Swift, officially a Chicago Bear. All right, and we covered basically DeAndre Swift's outlook, and I'm sure it'll be uh, plowed over many times. So we'll 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 stick with our topic here, and we can come back and, and talk about some of those breaking news stuff. But uh, to keep the flow of our rookie flag plant conversation, um, who's someone you're going to be irrationally talking about uh, from a rookie perspective, and then probably drafting a little bit earlier than the consensus, Cody? I just want to say first off, eight million per year is pretty uh, pretty ridiculous for three years. Pretty awesome number there. That's what Delvin got last year in a one year contract. If you guys remember, my flag plant is one hundred percent Javon Baker, the wide receiver from Central Florida. Javon Baker for me has been sitting around that wide receiver five, six, seven area um, for the majority of the cycle. His suddenness in and out of breaks is at a high level. I think his ball skills are second to few in the class. Um, Baker resurrected his career at UCF after going to Alabama as a four star prospect. 2023 he was an all big 12 first team wide receiver he is um going to finish top five in the dog rating as jason allwine brings up in the chat i told jason this down there immediately early in the clubhouse top dog of the year 100 7.2 yards after catch per reception top 20 in division one javon breaker brings a lot to the table he competed at alabama with devonta smith john mechie waddle jameson isaiah bond jermaine burton lots of dudes and then he finally was not getting the opportunities through two years he won a championship he dipped out. He went to Central Florida. He did the dang thing. Went for almost 2,000 yards in two seasons. I see a lot of Rice, Rashi Rice. I see a lot of Stephon Diggs in his game. And he's one of the most slam dunk prospects for me at six foot, one and a half, 200 pounds. He fits the archetype. And he's a very sudden uh, route runner with the ability to go up in contested situations and dominate. All right, guys. Um, good call right there. Uh, I'll just be brief. Flag plan. I still like Keon Coleman. I know the market doesn't like him as much. Uh, I know the the slower than expected forty time uh, was a disappointment. But everything I read about that gauntlet drill, which really measures uh, real real NFL football closer than a forty yard dash, had him at a, at a, a an acceptable game speed. This is I know we've seen like big guys like this fail in the NFL, but if you're picking early in the second round, the real NFL draft, how do you not take a shot on this guy? You know, especially if you passed on receiver in the first round. Um, all right. We can we if there's any other flag, we'll go one more round of flag plants because I know there's some players I want to hear your opinion on there, Theo. Just quickly, anything from uh the uh from you talked about Baker, right, Cody? I talked yeah. about Javon Baker. Yeah. Sure. So anything from Baker or Keon Coleman that you want to add that we didn't say, Theo? No, I mean, it just speaks volumes to how strong this wide receiver class is where we're going to get 17 guys drafted in, uh, by the end of day three at the wide receiver position. And Javon Baker, I think the really appealing thing about Javon Baker is uh, this is a guy that I think will be available in a lot of third rounds in rookie drafts. I think that he'll sneak into some second rounds, but it's going to be that second or third round pick. So this is a guy that you're not going to have to use a, a very high pick on that has a lot of traits that I know Cody and some really, really smart people are in on with Baker. And one guy for me, I'll flag plan another, another player 
Alan, the more and more I dive into Marshawn Lloyd, the more and more excited I get. Uh, this is a guy that uh, Cody and I discussed last week on his show. Can I uh, caveat Marshall. real quick about Marshawn yeah. Lloyd? I sniped him from you in our draft. Can I? Yes, yes, Alan. You. you sniped him. You sniped him from me at the two eleven in a super flex uh, mock draft. I ended up with Roman Wilson at the two twelve, so I, I I recovered all right. I didn't get too emotional, and it was all right. Uh, but Marshawn Lloyd, this is a guy that I think is still in the mix to be selected as one of the first running backs off the board. I think he's going to end up being drafted at the end of the second round or the third round. Uh, if there's a 220 pound back runs a four, four, six forty. I think he projects as a guy who can catch the ball at the NFL level as well. The last time we saw a DeMatha wide uh, running back drafted uh, this highly in the NFL draft, it turned into Brian Westbrook of the Philadelphia Eagles. So shout out to everybody in the DMV there with Marshawn Lloyd. And I love his path. The guy played at two colleges, went to USC and went to uh, South Carolina beforehand. And in high school, this is a guy that uh, was driving to school two hours every day from Delaware to get more exposure at a big-time high school program. You love seeing storylines like that. We saw that with the Roman Wilson uh, storyline about how he was getting on a plane. I love these guys that put in the work and end up getting to you know live their dream out. And I think Marshawn Lloyd, a lot of people are going to be talking about that story on draft day. Cody, the only thing I don't like about Lloyd, and I, I'm curious to what you would uh, weigh in on this, is that the below that threshold of college receptions that I like to see that he's going to be a competent pass catcher in the NFL. Maybe that doesn't matter, but when I see 18 and 13 receptions in consecutive years, usually I like to see 20 to 25 to know that the guy is going to be a 35 to 45 catch player in the NFL. Yeah, it's just not something that is his strong suit. He can do it. He did it very efficiently uh, down there at the Senior Bowl uh, in Mobile just a few weeks ago. So I, I like Marshawn Lloyd. Um, I loved him back when he was at South Carolina. The, the, for me, the thing is, is he just hasn't taken on the full workload to prove that he can be a three-down back. I'm not sure that that really fits his strong suit. I think he's more of a two-down back than anything. He's got the great upper upper body. Of course, Taylor Canabley, Tyler Canabley brings it up um, about the, the calves, and that's something that down there at the Senior Bowl was very apparent. And – I didn't say he had Darren McFadden calves. I said to Alex, man, this is the upper body of a Nick Chubb. This is the running back I want to see. This guy has the best cuts at this event. It's not even close. Some of the best vision. Dejan Edwards is up there too as far as vision goes at the Senior Bowl. But Marshawn Lloyd was so clear cut the number one. But when you get up on him, his calves, when I say look like sticks, they quite literally look like sticks. And that is something that Alex, who's been down there for 13 years, calls back. And Byron Lambert, who is another one from Roster Watch, um, would refer to that as the Darren McFadden Cavs. And that's something that um, historically doesn't translate to the NFL as far as staying healthy for the majority of your career. Now, what you can say about that is that not a lot of running backs stay healthy for the majority of their career anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but I think Marshawn Lloyd's a really good running back. I think he's going to translate well to the NFL. Again, I'm just a little bit nervous as far as the overall workload that we didn't see um, from a carry standpoint. And we've seen this from some of these Georgia guys over the past couple of years, but this isn't Georgia. This is South Carolina to USC. And he also just the, the lower half is the only thing that really pulls me back. Those are the two worries I have. But as far as pure rusher, pure running back, Marshawn Lloyd brings almost everything to the table. All right, guys. Well said by both. Cody, last flag plant player. And what do we mean by this, everyone? It just means it's someone that you're irrationally going to be attached to. There's going to be an emotional pick. And you're probably, you know, either going to, for better or for worse, you're going to go down on the ship or you're going to look like a hero, Cody. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to go running back here. And it's not because I am overly irrationally in love with this player. It's more so that I hate the class. And I have this player... Two players, actually. I'm going to talk about one, but I have two players here. Isaiah Davis and Tyron Tracy from, from Purdue. I saw Tyron Tracy down at the Shrine Bowl, and he was awesome. But Isaiah Davis is going to be the one. I have him currently slated here as a mid-third-round guy. I'm going to take him every time if I can get him there. Six foot one, 220 pounds, 10 and a half inch hands. Some of the biggest hands you'll see from any running back, really any uh, skill player uh, in the NFL. Over the last two years at South Dakota State, north of 1,450 rushing yards, north of Allen. 20 receptions both of those two years at South Dakota State as a freshman and a sophomore he combined for 1500 yards on the ground averaged over seven guards per carry in those two seasons uh, at South Dakota State Isaiah Davis is a guy that didn't have the best senior bowl he did have the Shrine Bowl invite I asked him I said why didn't you go to Shrine Bowl five of your teammates are there he said man as soon as I got that senior bowl invite you know where I was going 
So yeah, 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 you're right. He goes there. He has a good, good time. They didn't give him a lot of opportunities the first couple of days of practice, but he finished out the week strong. He's 6'1, 220, a big, big bruiser. He's young. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities for a guy like this to last long in the NFL. And you can point straight to a guy like Gus Edwards for looking at just at that opportunity. All right. Uh, that's going to conclude our rookie flag plans for now, guys. But um, I, I still want to get into some of this free agency news before we close out with our last 10 minutes or so here. All right. DeAndre Swift signs with the Bears. Uh, good deal for him. It sounds like he's going to be guaranteed to be on the roster for this year and, and next, right? I mean, it's a three-year deal, but we all know that's like the David Montgomery deal from last year a little bit. So what do you make now that we know what the backfield is going to look like? Is this a stay away from all three? What do you predict their ADPs are going to be, Theo Greminger? And um, I guess the good and the bad here. So we have Khalil Herbert, we have Roshan, and now we have Swift signed to that fresh deal. We can forget the other two when we're trying to figure out ADP here. The okay. Bears just told you what they think about DeAndre Swift. They yep. just paid him a ton of money. They're not bringing him in to have some three-way committee with Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson. I would predict that Khalil Herbert is probably not a Chicago Bear next year because they took in twenty four or twenty five in twenty four. Okay, I think I think like unless they view him as some cheap depth piece. Um, I think they could flip him and and at least get the the draft pick that they used on him a few years back. I mean, they could get a day three pick for Khalil Herbert, you know, from a number of teams. So I think DeAndre Swift, if Caleb Williams is drafted at 101 and then the Bears go ahead and use that 109 on a wide receiver, then I want DeAndre Swift. It's going to be a very good offense. We can criticize the amount of money that they spent on DeAndre Swift, but you don't give a guy who's 25 years old that contract not to use him and i think that that offense is trending up no matter what we think of the again you know i see some people in the chat very critical about the amount of money chicago spent on deandre swift but it doesn't matter the money's been spent he's going to be used he's 25 years old we've seen deandre swift have fantasy success i think he's a guy I would bet on to have a better season next year than he did this year in philly you look at the contracts, the contracts tell you exactly what the story is. $15 million guaranteed, but three years, 24.5. Ian Harditz, our, our good friend over at uh, MB Fantasy Life, he tweets out the top six contracts to running back position since 2016. And it funny, it's funny that number five and six come in back-to-back -back years, both former Philadelphia running backs. Sanders last year, Miles Sanders, four years, 25. This year, DeAndre Swift, three years, 24, averaging eight million per year. Of course, the contracts above that Lamar Miller didn't pan out. Jarek McKinnon, San Francisco didn't pan out. Chris Ivory, Jacksonville didn't pan out. Le'Veon Bell, New York Jets really didn't pan out. Four years, 52 million. So not a great track record here for the top six highest paid running backs over the last uh, eight years, but DeAndre Swift is in a situation now you brought it up. Caleb, Swift, Moore, potentially a Dunze or Neighbors or whatever. Lot of talent on that offense. We'll see what happens. Um, it looks like they're setting him. Uh, it looks like they're setting him up no. for success too, right? Because yeah. there was some, yeah. I guess, let's call them rumors that Caleb Will uh, Caleb Williams was not excited about signing or being picked by Chicago. Maybe they're show, you know, they're showing his camp, his father, right? That hey, we're going to put good weapons around you. We have DJ Moore. Now we're adding a pass catching running back. Um, get excited to come here uh, when we pick you, and then presumably they'll be able to turn Justin Fields into an asset. It could be, like you said, end up being a day two, late day two pick or something like that. So we like DeAndre Swift. Where do you predict his redraft ADP will fall guys in like, say in like a seasonal, like a best ball type of thing. Is he round five running back? Is he, are people going to get me more aggressive on him? Go ahead, Theo. People are going to be more aggressive right now. The running back, like if you look at where these running backs are falling, certainly there's going to be some guys who sign as free agents and we're going to see some shuffling ADBs. But look where Ty J Spears is being selected uh, on underdog right now. He's like running back 17. DeAndre Swift, if they do the things Cody's referencing in Chicago and they're one of the running backs is not a Chicago Bear next year, DeAndre Swift is going to be a 4-5 turn guy. All right. Yeah. Um, He's sitting at, in the eighth right now, mid-eighth, mid, mid yeah. eighth, running back 31 on underdog. There's fourth no round. reason he doesn't shoot up into the top 15. And Yeah. Yeah, like you yeah. said, fourth. That's, that's going to be a monumental jump. Yeah, I think I think we'll see him in round five to start because again, uh, how these formats are played, running backs aren't valued as much right away. That's fair, what? and and again, the wide receiver position it's getting steamed. But I think we're both in the same wheelhouse, like round four, <clears> round five. Like Cody said, that's a three round jump. And if you bought DeAndre Swift uh, on the cheap, you know, in in dynasty this off season, 
he just gained some dynasty value based on the contract installation that he has on an ascending offense. Nathan in the chat just asked the exact question I was going to bring back up to you because I mentioned it earlier, but I had him at running back nine going into the season this last year. Where, like, who are some players you would, like, you, I don't know where to really place him in, like Javante Williams or DeAndre Swift? Yeah, I think DeAndre Swift. Swift right. You've got three yeah. year contract. Swift. He's 25 years old. Yeah. I mean, that it would be Swift. Swift moves up a lot, but he he's not in he he's in where David Montgomery's from a contract sec, uh, security standpoint was last year where he's guaranteed to be on the roster and a primary player for 2 years. So in most running backs other than the elite guys it's a one year thing, right? It's a year to year. At least he has 2 years plus all of his talent. That's fair. That's fair. Um, when you talk about like actual team. ranking guys, I think that he he your people are going to be deciding between him and all the other free agents. So you taking Saquon Barkley, James or James Cook is more of a like a you know the bottom of the the RB one. Rashad White, players that all have you know non first round draft pe pedigree. You know Isaiah Pacheco. That's where you're going to see yeah. um, DeAndre Swift slot in. So yeah, that that ranking of uh, RB nine to RB fourteen, where it's a very similar flat tier. I think that's where we're going to see him slot in for dynasty fantasy football. I like it. Right. I want I want Allen uh, to to just sit here on the mic talking until we get another signing that we can talk about on the Sonic. <laughs> well, there's there's always next week, guys. All right, so hey, we got some offensive line, some offensive line coming in. Dion Dawkins, I, I saw that. Dion Dawkins, baby. I saw that. 30 right. minutes from Alan Soslowski <laughs> on Deion Dawkins. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, before we sign off, what I'm going to do is uh, I each want you to tell the player profiler audience the most important thing, one thing that you're working on right now that you want them to pay attention to. Uh, Cody, uh, you're going to be heading out to all these pro days, but what's the one piece of work that you want people to pay special attention to over the next few days? Uh, I'm right now I'm working on my NFL mock draft 5.0. That'll be out on Friday at rosterwatch.com. So you can look for that on Friday, but all of my pro day stuff, uh, you'll be able to find at rosterwatch.com or at the draft rankings.com, which is my new, uh, endeavor there connect connected to my Patreon. So the draft rankings.com probably for the most up-to-date pro day stuff. As I go to South Carolina, Clemson, and Georgia this week to cover some of our pros, our favorite prospects, Brock Bowers, Will Shipley, Spencer Rattler, Xavier Leggett. So it should be a good week. And give tell me a, give me a 40 yard dash uh prediction for my guy Brock Bowers, Cody. Four four eight. Nice. Uh Cody, so you you actually changed your uh a social media platform formerly known as Twitter to at Cody Carpentier. It used to be so how did you get it changed? How did you get them to change it? Is that a process? I no, I went to my edit profile and I didn't again. I, I tried this a long time ago and somebody owned that at that handle. And I actually just went in there randomly one day and I was like, well, let's check it out. And I typed it in and it was like save and it just worked. Um, so you, you have to go in there and you have to edit profile, go on your desktop, type in your password a couple times, do like a, a, a verification to make sure you're real human and send you an email, all this fugaze. And then it, yep. it, you know, it worked because my name was available. I don't right. know if there. I don't know. There's probably like a hundred thousand Alan Soslowski's out there, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to do that. I, but. I have mine. I from the beginning. Well, you I, have I, your... Yeah, I, I on all social media, all all emails. I always get my name because I, you know, all this other stuff in your life changes. Your name never does. So follow Cody as we do at Cody Carpentier. Theo, what's the most important piece of content that player profiler that you want to promote right now to the audience? Uh, we have a lot, a lot cooking. Uh, you can find me actually on uh, Reddit AMA, Dynasty Reddit AMA, every single Monday at two o'clock. Um, don't expect to see Cody in there, but you'll see some some other player profiler uh, guests <laughs> joining me. Uh, you know, and today uh, Dario Ofstein will be with me, uh, and we're also streaming that right here on YouTube and Twitter. Those have been a lot of fun. Uh, the rookie guide, like I said, look for that sometime soon. I have two articles dropping shortly, uh, Dynasty Risers and also a Rookie Positional Rankings article that should drop this week. And then Dynasty Life. You find me here on the Sonic Truth podcast. Dynasty Life, I have Heath Cummings on tomorrow and a bunch of really, really fun guests. And Alan, we might have a really fun Sonic Truth next week as well, something we'll look to announce 
over the next couple of days. All right. Good teaser right there. Only thing that I'll let the audience know about is uh, I am back hosting every Friday the Rotowire Dynasty Fantasy Football Podcast where I feature a new guest every week. We've had Cody on there. Theo is on our schedule. But this week we have uh, Sigmund Bloom coming on. So looking forward to that. All right, guys. Great show. You did it again. Uh, we're going to end it there. The, another Sonic Truth Dynasty Focus Fantasy Football Podcast for Cody Carpentier for Theo Greminger. I'm Alan Sislowski. We'll be back next week with a new episode of the Sonic Truth. From the pod father to you, I deeply appreciate you tuning in. And many ask, what can I do? What can I do to help support the host, the research they do, the production costs? Go to playerprofile.com, Dynasty Deluxe, World Famous Draft Kit, Rankings, DFS Dominator, and of course, Data Analysis. Subscribe to any one of those and you support all of us and take Player Profiler to the moon.